vorrei raccontare una storia piccola. È la storia piccola della mia vita. Non è troppo interessante, ma tutto è onesto, tutto è vero, tutti i fatti. Ok, Livingstone è stato nato in Salem, Massachusetts. Old by American standards, a baby by your rules. Salem, Massachusetts was founded in 1620. By 1620, the Italian nation was not born, but parts of the Italian nation were already in the vanguard of world life, trading, interactions, art, music, you name it. We were a few little people on a small, almost island in a place with no heat, almost nothing. The food came from deer that ran in the woods and it wasn't sure we were going to make it, as they'd say in English. When I reached age 12, one of my father's cousins, un altro medico, molto alto, un gran voce, mi ha detto, ho oh, un regalo per te. It was a subscription to a great United States medical journal. I was age 12, 12. Ok? 12. And I knew niente di medicina. Assoluta. Sport, sì, lo sport, lo football, ma medicina, no. And it was clear that here, a man in my family hands me a envelope like this, in which there is a five-year subscription to the New England Journal of Medicine, age 12, message. There was a consensus. There was a conspiracy in my family that David, Davide, deve essere un medico, no? Non è problema se sì, un gran problema se sì, no. <laughs> By then, the, as many of you know, the salt polio vaccine had been developed. And that was an, a disease of which my family were deeply frightened. Many children of my age developed it, became paralyzed, and we all saw the terrible outcomes. But um, we thought that, that, you know, maybe it would never come, that polio would go away. And one day, uh, a vaccine appeared, discovered by a man uh, in California, Salk. And the vaccine began to work. And fewer children of my age and my sister's age developed the disease. People were not stuck in machines that breathed for them. They avoided the disease and breathed for themselves. Not long thereafter, I decided to renew my subscription to the New England Journal because there was something magical about the cure of polio that I thought was worth, even though I didn't understand the words, reading it over and over again. This, dis this, dis this disease was gone. Babia, huh? That's a great thing. And I thought to myself, you know, maybe I would become un medico. Well, my education at an all-boys school in New Hampshire, very cold in the winter, very cold in the summer. The food was terrible. My friends were good. E lo sport, è stato numero uno, was okay. Um, but my uncle sent me a resubscription after three more years to the same journal, and he suggested that I ask my friends with whom I lived in the dormitory if they would like to become doctors. None did. None have. And um, I was also deemed by my family um, to be ready to take care of patients at age 15. Not possible, right? Not possible. And so I decided that I better go first to university and then to medical school, which I did at Tufts. And by the summer of 1965, I was formally deemed ready to learn how to care for people who were ill. And that was a great moment. I was chosen to train in an old hospital, not a very pretty place. Senza l'aria condizionata, senza riscaldamento, anche quello. And so it was tough living, bad food, but great medicine and great teaching in the center of Harvard, right in the middle of the Harvard Medical School campus. Um, and this school helped me believe in myself because in this old place, the first successful kidney transplant was performed, and the doctors who did it, most of them sadly died by the time, but one of them survived and received the Nobel Prize. After two years of really intensive training, not much heat, no air conditioning, bad food, 
but lots of experience in caring for people with a variety of diseases. Um, I, I was um, uh, required to make a decision. And the decision was tough. America was at war. This was 1965. We were at war in Vietnam. Doctors were being drafted, conscripted into the military. And many conscripts, and I expected if I were conscripted, I would go as well, off to war in Vietnam. And um, one would have to learn, even though I was trained in internal medicine, how to do surgery under battle conditions. Very, very scary stuff. Well, I was prepared to serve. My father was a soldier. My grandfathers both were soldiers. My grandfather was a soldier. My uncle, his stepson, was a soldier. I was simultaneously conflicted by a growing affection for biomedical research. A senior professor at Tufts, a very distinguished gentleman, Morris Friedkin, had taken me into his laboratory, and I'm not sure why. Forse è stato un sbaglio, but for me, è stato un gran piacere. And in his laboratory, he personally taught me at the bench the skills, the rudimentary skills, and the rudimentary way of thinking about doing sperimenti, the essence of la ricerca. And he was a cancer researcher, to boot. We published a paper together, the highest moment of my entire education, to see my name in a journal. The paper wasn't great, but for me, it was a really uh, enormous moment. In fact, we published this paper, and I was soon bitten, in American expression, by the excitement that's associated with obtaining real research results that could be reproduced by any other scientist and were really true. That was a truly great moment. And I was impressed by the highly rigorous way my teacher thought. If it didn't fit, it wasn't right. And that was a great message. And motivated by the desire of learning how to become both a successful doctor and maybe even a scientist who's able to decipher, you know, important mysteries that surround dangerous diseases, come cancro, no? I decided to learn how to do both. Medicina e la ricerca. Sono gemelli. Veramente. And first I applied for one of the few, in order to do that, I applied for one of the few available positions where a young U.S. doctor in wartime, durante una guerra, could learn how to do biomedical research and at the same time to perform his required military service. Hence I applied for and, and won a training post at the U.S. National Institute of Health, which is the center de la ricerca contro il cancro, contro la malattia negli Stati Uniti, un grande istituzione, located near Washington. It is the largest biomedical research facility in the United States. There, I was commissioned as an officer in the United States Navy. I never wore the uniform because no gun went off. If it had, I was warned, off to Vietnam, you would go. I worked under the tutelage of um, one of America's fastest rising young physician scientists. He was a doctor and he was a scientist. His name was Philip Leder, and he was to me a marvelous mentor. He's still alive and I revere everything he ever taught me, although it was tough love. For any of you who speak English, you know what that means. Frown, speak loud, and say, it isn't very good, David, keep working hard. Phil made me aware of what it takes to do a thoroughly credible and reproducible experiment. That means ogni volta gli stessi risultati, no, no, neanche cosa differente. And he also showed me how best to choose a research problem to solve. It needed to be so important that when you solved it, one would have learned a great deal about a terribly important problem and thereby would have advanced one's ability to pursue it further with new and sharper tools. And B, he taught me that I should be as adventurous as possible. Take chances, make risk, be your friend, he used to say. Um, because in conceiving an approach to whatever problem one wanted to solve, which was innately difficult, risk is part of the game. Adventure is its handmaiden. From NIH, where I worked with Phil, uh, my beloved mentor, on the mechanisms by which cells build proteins. The earliest days in trying to understand how cells build 
the machinery with which they need to work. Um, led to um, my understanding that um, it was important to learn more science. In order to do medical research, I needed to know even more that I was being taught at NIH, and so I returned to Harvard and began to learn another science. It's called biochemistry. Un po' anoioso a questo tempo, ma adesso è importante nel centro della ricerca contro il cancro. And it turned out, therefore, that two years back at Harvard, learning how to do biochemistry were pivotal in my career. They made it, in my mind, a solid fact that I would do both, medicine and research. Medicine, and I soon thought, uh, research on cancer. It was by then the biggest mystery that anybody faced. It was almost uniformly terrible. There was almost nothing known, but that meant that the vista, the future, the horizon was potentially enormous. So while learning how to perform biochemistry research, I soon became interested in how cancer started. Almost nothing was known, therefore I returned to NIH a second time. I hadn't had enough in the first trip. I came back for a second one. And um, one of the few institutions in America, it was, where top-notch cancer research was being performed. That was the good news. The bad news was there weren't very many people performing it because it wasn't popular yet. It became popular in the future. And I learned how to start my own laboratory, tiny about the size of this table. Three people, me, me, and me. Morning, noon, and night. And, and, and we, we did all right. We didn't have much money. Uncle Sam, the leader of the United States government, the mythical one, would drop a few thousand dollars a few times a year, and we'd do some more experiments. And I loved every single second of it. Well, having made little progress in my cancer research experiments in NIH, I was recruited, recruited to Harvard in 1973 to a position at what became Dana-Farber and where I still work happily every single day. And Dana-Farber, being one of America's most respected cancer research centers, is also one where one has to practice rigorous medicine and rigorous research. And that is a principle that those of us who've grown up in its system um, live, breathe, eat, and teach to the young. So at Dana-Farber, I've undertaken two lines of work. First, I am also a medical oncologist. And until about 10 years ago, I took care of cancer patients and taught our trainees the ins and outs of cancer care in a white uh, jacket, a long white jacket with my name imprinted, spelled wrong, L-I-V-I-N-G-S-T-O-N-E. There's no E. It's still there. And um, I also wanted to understand what the first steps were that bring a cancer cell to life. There had to be principles, and I began to work on the problem at that time. Now, 24 years have passed since um, I began to focus on this problem, and I found myself starting to be interested in breast cancer and ovarian cancer, two very common, two very dangerous diseases, certainly at that time, still the case for many. Our major thrust in my laboratory has been to understand how a small number of dedicated genes, a gene is a packet of information, it's an instruction, like I say to the poliziotto, vado io, and he says, no, no is right, vado io is not, you stay, it's a red light. Well, every gene issues an instruction. Si, no, vado lei, o no, vado lei, o no, vado lei, o no. And it turns out that starting to understand what the rules that cancer cells live by and died by turned out to be a great part of the work that we began to do on breast and ovarian cancer. Fortunately, we've been lucky in this work, in no small measure, importantly, in no small measure, largely because of the diligence, the hard work, and the brilliance of numerous young students and research fellows, some from Italy, whom I've had the privilege of training in cancer research. They are the people who did all the work, all the experiments, did all the rigorous tests, and they should be here tonight. I could be happily sitting over there, and you would see a lot of beautiful faces from all over Europe, all over the United States and Asia, 
and it gives me a thrill to even think about standing with them. Finally, I want to say that while I'm here today at your special invitation to, read, to receive this extremely important and highly esteemed prize, not only would I love to see my young people here receiving the prize in my place, you will learn of them in the future as their discoveries begin to play an important role in reducing the burden, the morbidity, and the mortality of cancer. One of them has already won America's most distinguished medical research prize, the Lasker Prize, of which I am enormously proud. So I want to tell you that I am honored to be here, di fronte di voi, in this beautiful castello, and in this magnificent city where I've had the privilege of spending three days every summer working on your symposio. And in summary, I would like to offer you the following thought, which is apprezzo profondamente l'onore che mi avete conferito e vi ringrazio molto. Grazie a lei.